Zach from the Try Guys almost died before his wedding, and I'm not kidding. What up, it's your boy, Corn Diddy. I, I'm sorry. Zach is of course one of the original Try Guys and master of all things digital, amassing billions of views in a career beginning at BuzzFeed and extending now into a massive media enterprise of his own. And while Zach has had enormous success in creating content for online audiences, he hasn't quite enjoyed the same successes when it comes to navigating the healthcare industry. Zach lives with a chronic pain condition known as ankylosing spondylitis, a diagnosis that took countless years and doctors to come to. On top of that, Zach suffered an accident at his home this year that resulted in him being hospitalized for weeks, putting his wedding and life in jeopardy. I've reacted to Zach's health videos before, but today I wanted to dive deep. So I flew out to LA and invited him to come on the checkup to discuss not only his healthcare woes, but our issues with American healthcare industry in general. Despite his frustrations, Zach is back on his feet and not slowing down anytime soon. I'm back. Right? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm back, I'm on the streets, run for your lives. And the Achilles tendons in full force. Yeah, you know what's crazy? Okay, so you and I had a talk <laughs> and you asked me like, everything's fine, right? And I was like, proudly like, yes, I don't even need physical therapy. I'm so good. And Mike, I was not done. <laughs> I was so far what, from you done. you had to do a lot of PT after? I haven't done PT and maybe I should. I also, we're waiting for some test results. I may have a bleeding disorder. No. Yeah. Wow, you're learning a lot about <laughs> your body in such a short period of time. Well, because when I was in the surgery, they were like, you bleed a lot. Oh, they said that. Yeah. And then when, when they went to close the wound... Um, they were like, whole, you know, okay, so I had um, a Pemrose, which mm -hmm. is, I call the, the forbidden boba straw. <laughs> yeah, you call it a drain. That's, <laughs> um, so that was sticking out of my leg to help it drain. Yep. And when they finally took it out, I, they, like, it was two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, and I would not stop bleeding. Oh my God. And he's like, this is wrong. Like, I just cut a suture. Like, this, there's nothing... That it should keep bleeding. Like this. Yeah. So then they cauterized my wound, mm -hmm. which is gross. It smells gross. Too. It smells crazy. Yeah. You're laying on, uh, you know, you're, you're laying face down because it's the back of my my leg, mm -hmm. and you just hear like, tss, tss, and you smell. It's not even like, it's not even bacon. It just it, it's, it goes right to burn. Okay. So wait, they singed your your wound, mm -hmm. and then it stopped bleeding. Mm -hmm. But now they're exploring potential. Yeah, we're past the Factor elevator pitch. Factor five deficiencies or something? Uh, you know what? Yeah. I no think way. that's it. I, <laughs> he said factor something. Okay. He, I, I was with my doctor and he's like, Ashkenazi? And I'm like, yeah. He's mm. like, yeah, I know what's going on. The Jews. Uh -huh, they the get Jews all of us. strike again. Yeah. So yeah, basically he was explaining that there's two different types of clotting. And as I understand it, again, I haven't gotten the results back. So he gave me like the, the elevator pitch of it mm. and then said, I'll explain it if it comes back positive. Uh, this is just something I need to be aware of if I bleed a lot, which is a giant cut or surgery. And then it's like a nasal spray and it, but you're confirmed to have this already or not, not yet. yet. Okay. No. So maybe if you would, that's the route you're going to yeah. have to take. Yeah, yeah. Well, because like, for example, when they say hemophilia A, right, there's okay. a hemophilia A and B. So A is factor eight deficiency. Uh. And the way I remember that is A8. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to come up with all sorts of yes, mnemonics all in med the time. school? Yeah. What's the stupidest one you have? The uh, metacarpals of the wrist. Mm -hmm. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Wait, 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 wait. And so, I, don't ask me what they stand for. But each of those means a different metacarpal. See, I don't even know. I don't even thing. know what a metacarpal. I thought a metacarpal was a Pokemon. So It could be. Yeah. It should be, actually. So metacarpals are in your wrist, metatarsals are in your feet metatarsals yeah so Hell you yeah. could have potentially damaged the metatarsal <sighs> and i okay so this is going back to where we started i was so scared that when this all happened that i would have nicked a nerve or, or something sure. and i i proudly told you that everything was it's fine, fine. Yeah. <laughs> um and then for the next two months my foot would tingle all the time mm. and i go oh no i've I spoke, I jinxed myself, yeah. um, but it's kind of, it's gone away. And now every now and then I'll feel like a little weirdness tingle mm -hmm. in my toes. Uh, but for the most part, we seem to be okay. Okay. Hey, but you told me a lot of shitty experiences you had with the medical system. Oh yeah. Yeah. Even I, like when you were in the hospital with your leg, like you were getting bills that were like screwing you over and. I, I someone, I mean, you, when you were in the hospital, you get woken up so much and yeah. I mean, one, you're on painkillers, so you're delirious, but. Mm -hmm. They like, you know, at, at midnight, they check your vitals. And then at 
two in the morning, like you have to get up to pee or, or no, for, in this case, it was explosive diarrhea. Mm. Uh, C. And, diff. Yeah. yeah. And then at four, three in the morning, your surgeon like comes to check on your wound yeah. and then uh, they check your vitals again at 6 a.m. And then someone comes in and with a with an insurance form. And it's like, hey, you have to pay this right now. And I'm like, what? Okay, just sign whatever you want, bro. And the just tell them to bill your insurance company. Just, just always tell them to bill. And they're gonna be like, no, we just, I don't care what you say. Not signing anything right now. Not of sound mind. Don't do it. Um, I even because I hit my out of pocket. Wow. And people, and I don't like. I'm just so used to like people pleasing. Like when they tell me to pay, I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. Like I, I didn't, I've never hit my out of pocket, so mm-hmm. I didn't know what that was. And I didn't know my, my wife yelled at me when I went in for, for something. And she's like, there's no copay anymore. You're, yeah. you're done. Yeah. And I didn't know that. And so I paid my, but only for the year, for the year. Yeah. But I paid my copay and it's not like the insurance company is going to be like, Oh dude. Oh yeah. my God. Here's your 50 bucks back. Sorry about that. Yeah. They're just gonna the pay. office should do that though. And they should. Some places are messy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the economics of our healthcare system, something terrible is going to happen for it to fix itself. And the I, fact that we're waiting for the iceberg while on the Titanic is kind of weird. What could be, I, cause I feel like something terrible happens every day. So what, what, no, no, something colossal, yeah. colossally needs to happen and not needs to, will happen. But would. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, I'll give you an example. You saw what happened in New York with COVID in March, 2020. Mm-hmm where the healthcare system couldn't bring in enough resources to help people with heart attacks, something like that will happen again. Well, what's wild to me is that, yeah, I mean, you say something colossal happened. Something colossal did happen. Sure. Our, our medical system is, is uh, f- crumbling under its own weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, doctors and nurses are beyond burnt out and, and leaving. And so now, like when I was in the hospital, you were getting all these travel nurses, mm-hmm. nothing against travel nurses, but it's their first week in LA. Yeah, they're learning where the stuff is in the hospital. They don't know where, like, it just, it's hard for them. Yeah. Uh, and that's a bad experience for us. And then the, I was at UCLA Hospital. You know, I have nothing but great things to say about the people, but the system. And that's is, UCLA. Is bad. And UCLA is as good as it gets. Yeah. People in the yard, they were lining uh, the hallways. Like the trolleys in the trolleys, like every every cubic inch of that place was filled with a bed and you were under fluorescent lights day and night. Um, And it's because there was no room in the rest of the hospital capacity. There's just no room. That's like I that to me as a non-medical person is I can't fathom that a hospital is just out of room. What do you mean it's out of room? That's what you're here for. Yep. You're here. And I also while we are hitting the U.S. hard with this. This is an international problem. Mm. The U.K. is dealing with this. Australia is dealing with this. Like everywhere, this is a problem. Now, no one can quite figure it out. Is this something that it's like bloated salaries and bureaucratic misspending, or is it that people are getting sicker? It's in and, the and U.S. You, I, I can speak way, to the U.S. Put you on the spot no, no, no. here. It's a U- I could speak to the U.S. issue because I can't speak to what's going on really in the U.K. or Australia. But in the U.S., the administrative cost to yeah. run a hybrid system has gotten so out of control that the healthcare costs have 10x what they were 20 years ago and it has nothing to do with doctors getting paid more or more doctors working or more nurses or their wages going up it's for every doctor you need like 10 staffers to make sure the insurance pays and to make sure that this pharmacy actually dispenses the medicine and and a front desk administrator to make sure that they pay their copay. And it's like... So when you say hybrid system, you mean all of the bullshit that it takes to go from the doctors doing their job to uh, uh, whatever insurance entanglement to sign off on this. Sort of. When I say hybrid system, like in Canada, they have a universal healthcare system. In the UK, they have a universal healthcare system. Here, we have sometimes government-funded healthcare programs, Medicaid, Medicare... But then we also have employee-backed healthcare. But then we also have private healthcare. Mm-hmm. And that sort of hybridization means when you come into my office, I have no idea as a doctor what you have to pay because there's so many friggin' different things 
versus in the UK, you know what's going on. Right. And then, of course, anytime this is brought up, any universal health care, there is the the fear that having universal health care means I will lose my ability to the incredible private health care sure. that I, that but I, rich person, want. It's not like universal health care is like a one-size-fits-all solution either. Look at the UK. They're, uh-huh. they're struggling with their universal health care system, too. It's crumbling under debt because someone has to pay for that, too. Sure. So the taxes need to be raised and people don't want their taxes raised. And it's like, who pays for it? And it's like, okay, the billionaires, but then the billionaires move their money elsewhere. <laughs> and now you can't tax it anymore. And now <laughs> it's not coming into your system. And it's like, holy shit, this is so complicated. I'd rather react to medical memes. <laughs> it's so complicated and it's so unbelievably important because we're all going to go through this. Yes. It, That's why anyone who thinks they're like, oh, I'm taking supplements. I will never need to deal with this. You're wrong. You're fucking wrong. Everybody Sorry, is yeah. going through this. Yeah. Um, we we got into the, you know, you asked me about the the issues that I've had with, I forget how you phrased it, the issues I've had with the medical system mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. Um, and that was like a very intense one. But even just on a day-to-day, you know, I, I have a chronic condition. I have ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. And it took me a decade to get that diagnosed. Yeah. And I'm a... I'm a white dude. I'm the easy one to get mm-hmm. diagnosed. It's so women, people of color have a really, really hard time yeah. uh, getting getting uh, any sort of invisible illness or chronic condition or anything, anything. Well, yeah, women, chronic conditions, like that's the top two misdiagnosed things. Yeah. Because here's what happens. Everyone wants to, we call it punting in healthcare, where you don't want to deal with the problem because it takes a lot of work and you're already under this huge load. So maybe it's not even because you're a bad person, but just because mm. like there's like 10 rocks you're holding up and then if you get one more, you're worried. So you punt the rock to someone else. But what ends up happening with people who have non-specific symptoms, when I say non-specific, meaning if you come in and you have AS and you have back pain and fatigue, that could be 500,000 yeah. different conditions. Yep. So in order to like properly diagnose, it takes a lot of work to do a proper history, a proper physical, to order the correct tests without overordering tests and all these things, have a good communication line with you. So people are like, I'll punt it. Try some ibuprofen. (laughs) And guess what? You can't really sue them Mm -hmm. because they're like, "Uh, there's back pain and I said it's musculoskeletal, is it not? And they're technically right, but they're also technically doing a disservice by doing it. And while I want to blame individual providers for it, it's a systemic issue. And a lot of times this goes into the issue of gaslighting where it's easy to villainize uh, physicians or even nurses and say they give women bad care or they give people with chronic conditions bad, bad care. If they're set up to fail by the system, how can we blame them? If the research on skin conditions were only done on people with white skin, how can we blame doctors for being bad at diagnosing dark skin colors? They weren't trained. Sure. So like, yes, they can go the extra mile. It's it's a systemic issue as much as it is a personal one. Yes, exactly. And that goes across the board, whether we're talking about heart attacks in women, the the skin color issue for dermatologic conditions, uh, diagnosing uh, and spending enough time with a patient for autoimmune or chronic conditions. All of that yields to really bad care. And you know what that leads to? People being susceptible to miracle potions and cures in the naturopathic side. Sure. Because those people are like, has the medical society and service done you wrong? We're here to be your ear. And it sounds like a better deal. It sounds like a better deal. And I, I also think that there's just such a desire for the magic bullet. Yeah. I, I've been looking for the magic bullet in my AS mm-hmm. everywhere I can. I, I was hoping that medicine was the magic bullet. Yeah. And then I went, well, okay, uh, maybe acupuncture is the magic bullet. Maybe there's no there's no one thing. It's a toolkit. You yeah. need... Uh, uh, you just need a variety of things. And, and unfortunately with chronic conditions, there's usually not the one thing that makes everything all better. If it was that easy, we would just fix everything. Yeah. And it's really not. And anytime you do something that works in medicine, you always end up creating the other effect of doing something else, Mm. whether that's a side effect that's negative or just an unintended effect. And a lot of these supplements are like, it's natural. There's no risk. It's like, if there's no risk, that means it's not doing anything either. I, I'm curious about something. So 
advice that you would have for me or for patients. Okay. Because I trust doctors slash I don't want to know anything. Oh, I love being stupid little boy. Okay. I like my brain is like filled with movie facts and nothing else. Oh, what what do you mean movie facts? I Sorry, just, I, I just like movies. Like quotes? Eh, sure, quotes, but I, I know who directed what oh, and okay. I know how they shot this scene in Children of Men. And I, I that's what I that's what my brain likes thinking about. Okay. Like thinking about camera composition and, and whatnot. But even with even with my chronic disease, I don't want to know anything about it, mm. which is a weird thing, right? Why? I, it's just, I, I, well, why? Like, what, is because it? I, I mean, the real answer is I want it again, one magic bullet to make it all better. And I don't have to think about this. Mm. It's denial. It's denial of something being a part of you. It's fatigue, annoyance, yeah. anger. It sounds like all of these emotions that you're having, yep. having to deal with this situation. Yes. But then something that happens that is quite negative, And I, I think Look, uh, part of me not getting a diagnosis for a long time, I think it's systemic. I think it's the doctor's issue. And I probably shouldn't blame myself, but I do a little bit because I'll go in and I'll underplay my symptoms or I'll go, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how bad it's been. Maybe it can't be that bad. And I, I start to doubt myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it took me getting to just this unbelievable breaking point until I, I snapped and you know, demanded an answer. Yeah. But it was years of being told like, oh, it sounds like you have a bad back. And I go, oh, you're right. Yeah, you, you know, you're right. It's, it's I'm, I don't work out enough. That's why I have it. I, I had this pain. It's sure. not something worse. And I imagine there are a lot of people like me who, when they are told a potential uh, uh, solution, or I'm sorry, a potential explanation, the punt, mm -hmm. they take that and yep. they don't challenge it. Yeah. So advocating for yourself, just as equally as I want to advocate for systemic change, I equally advocate for individuals to make change on their own. Because just like, like a really simple example is my friend was getting his apartment renovated and he had painters come over and give him a quote to paint the three bedroom apartment. That was like 1500, 1600 square feet. They said 60,000 <laughs> and he paid it. I'm one of those people, by the way, I would not pay it, but I'm like, I guess that's how much it costs. Yeah. I, but and like, he's like, Ugh. I just wanted to make sure that they would do it right. And I didn't want to underpay them. But guess what ended up happening? They still did a shitty job. He still had to call them back. They didn't show up. So like as much as you want someone to take it off your hands or the system to do a better job, ultimately no one will do it better as much as you. Yep. And that sucks because that's kind of how life is. You got to do it. I, it's like arming yourself with the most advocacy and knowledge, even when you don't want to do it, it's ultimately like going to give you the best outcomes. No matter how nice the system is, no matter how good your doctor is, you or your loved one advocating for you is going to give you the best outcomes. Uh, the most important mental shift that I've had in my medical treatment, but all throughout my life, is that no one is responsible for you except, except you. for you. Yep. And... I look, man, I want to just be a little baby boy. Oh, that I know, sounds so I great. Know. I, I want I want mama health doctors to mom and dad to just take care of me. Yeah. And I go in and I say, I got the boo-booo. And you just go, well, here's the boo-boo yeah. guy. -boo I, I trust the doctor. The doctor's yep. going to do everything great. But you can't. You can't. You can't. It's not to say you you don't it's appreciate saying, doctors. No, but. it's saying you have to question. You have to question. So you, n don't be a cynic. Be a skeptic. Okay. I like I that. I think that's a good approach when it comes. To, that's how I treat like novel treatments. Because when it comes to something new being discovered, everything new initially sounds a little wacky. I mean, the first person to advocate to wash hands in between performing autopsies and delivering babies was killed for his thoughts on that. Killed? Killed. Killed? Killed. From the, what? The YouTube video coming soon. I like that. Yeah. From what? The anti-soap legislation? Uh, no, doctors saying like, what do you mean you're telling us there's invisible things that we're putting on patients that we're killing them? And they tried to lock him up in an insane asylum and tortured him, beat him, and he died. Wow. So, Bleak. yes, every idea is going to sound a little wacky. So you have to be skeptical and put that idea to test, but it doesn't mean that you're a cynic that anything new that sounds interesting or miraculous needs to be instantly not believed. I'm curious. I, I found that doctors are, are, I don't know, forced or if it's just their the way that their mind works is that mm -hmm. if something hasn't been 
uh, clinically researched, mm -hmm. they seem to be somewhat dismissive of it. So I told my rheumatologist, who I adore, that I had been hearing from people with AS that a plant-based diet was uh, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, well, you know, it can't hurt, but there's no... Like, he wouldn't tell me that that was a good idea. And I don't sure. know if that was because I can't tell you that's a good idea because it hasn't been researched. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think doctors, we are trained to be like, there's an evidence level rating for everything. And if it doesn't have one, we really shouldn't recommend it. And then you'll have the other end of the spectrum. Well, they'll recommend anything and everything just because their expert opinion, they think it works. Right. And I'll tell you, the most dangerous mistakes in history have come as a result of bad expert opinion. Mm. I mean, George Washington was killed because some expert doctor said we need to balance his humors. So they made him bleed and puke and have diarrhea and they killed him. I don't know this. Yeah. That would have been way more exciting to learn than like chopping down the cherry tree. Right. So that's what we talk about on the YouTube channel. We yeah. have a video how every president died. How do you feel about things like acupuncture? How do I feel about them? Like yeah. I've used acupuncture successfully, yeah. but then I've also used acupuncture where they damaged my nerve in my hand. Ooh. And it was like a really big problem where I had serious neuropathy. Oh, that's not good. That's actually probably good that that happened because hmm. it shows that again, acupuncture is not hundred percent safe, which means that it doesn't work in some cases. Sure. Cause anything that works has side effects. So I had a side effect from acupuncture, Yeah, but I've also had it work. I've, I'll have some day. I, it's one of those things where uh, acupuncturists have tried to explain to me, and I'm like, I, I don't. It sounds what you're telling me sounds crazy. I'll, I'll tell you. But it, then I have effects, and I'm like, well, I yeah. woke up this morning and I couldn't move my neck, and I went to acupuncture, and now I can move my neck. Yeah. So I don't care what's happening. There, it's not uniform. Like w when you go to check your blood sugar, there is a uniform rating of what's normal. And when it comes to either acupuncture education or knowledge, it's not uniform what's happening. Mm. You go to one acupuncturist, they do needles in this area. You go to another one for the same problem, they'll do it in a different area. Right. And it's not very universal versus if you come to me and you're a type 2 diabetic, I have guidelines and I'm like, this is the first medicine that I start. This is the second medicine that I start. And if your sugar's still out of control, we start insulin and here's the dosing regimen. But acupuncture is kind of like, whatever that person wants. Right, sure. So I think that's where we run into issues, even with testing it. They do sham acupuncture, but like, eh. Sham acupuncture? So like, in order to compare if something works, you have to do a randomized controlled okay, study. See. So one group has to get the placebo. And the placebo is like, some people think that they're getting acupuncture, but it's sham. It's like a sticker. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. <laughs> that's fun. So they have tried doing that, but it's never ideal. So it's hard to test some things, for sure. Yeah. Um, my idea when it comes to those things is alternative medicine can be something to try if it's not high risk and it's not telling people to go away from something that is proven. Yeah. no, and That's and where I think it can live. My take on it all is, is supplemental as well. Like yeah. I'm not going to throw my medicine away yeah. because I'm, you know, doing X, Y, or Z. Uh, but if that can be an additional tool in my toolkit... Amazing. And if I can then get to a place where I feel so amazing because of my diet and my exercise and my treatments, and whatever, you can wean off of maybe it, yeah. I can wean off of the, the yeah. medicine, but I'm not going to assume that one again is that magic bullet that is going to offset the other. Yeah. My just issue with the natural community is that they make natural sound safe and not everything natural is safe. Yep. Arsenic is natural. Cyanide yeah. is natural. So not everything is safe. And then also you have people who become predatory in the space. Yeah. And they start promising miracle cures and they're like, oh, I can do acupuncture and boost your immune system and help you sleep better. It's like, oh, just can we start with the neck spasm and like focus on that for a second? <laughs> there is a, I believe it was in India, a man with ankylosing spondylitis was stung by a scorpion. Don't do this. It cured his AS. No, 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 don't do this. I, well, I'm going to tell you okay. to go to the, 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 it cured his AS. And so the doctors were like, uh... Cool, but what do we do with this information? Because sure. you can't, you know, you talk you about study that's the scorpion. natural, but that's poison. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you can't ethically try that. Uh, well, you could and like extract the poison the extract, and, blah, 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 and put the it in little thing, petri right. dishes and do all this stuff. But maybe it's just a fluke. Maybe something else happened. It could have been maybe, maybe he was going to get cured anyway because of other lifestyles and he happened to get 
uh, uh, stabbed by a scorpion. I'm going to blow your mind right now. Okay. In the 15th or 16th century, there existed hotels called whale hotels <laughs> that advertised that if you sit in a dying carcass of a whale, inhaling its fumes for 30 hours, it would cure you of rheumatism. Because some guy jumped into a whale's carcass, stayed there and claimed that it cured his rheumatoid arthritis. So all these whale hotels popped up. I'm not making this up. There's this legitimate- is what year? 15th, 16th century, am I correct? Uh, it's like 100 years ago because it was a photo of it. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was the- You know, I also don't love this fact because I think it's shady. But it, there's images of it. There's images of a guy- And it's from the Library of Congress. And there- this is listed on the .gov Library of Congress. Aren't my website. tweets in the library? library? Website, there is a screenshot of a newspaper listing advertising a whale hotel. Yeah. There's not good evidence that people went to these places and sat in whales outside of one photo of a guy inside a whale. It was I a thing. It it's, a, it's fun. The library I get why of Congress. He likes it. But that's like their scorpion story. Yes. Are you going to go swim in a whale carcass? I mean, if if we got cameras, no, absolutely. There was um, there is a woman who uh, I believe she has Lyme disease, mm -hmm. and she uh, she uses bee sting therapy. Oh yeah, I've heard of which this. I I always thought would be a really fascinating video. Um, she she will sting down her spine. I think once a month she takes bees that are are old and are about to die anyway, um, and and she credits that with curing. Her, her Lyme disease, I believe it's Lyme disease. And, and to me, that, that I don't advocate for that. I think it's amazing for her, and I'm thrilled that she had it. It's, you know, that's another thing that you can't really ethically reproduce because some people are allergic to bee stings. And th then I mean, you could ethically reproduce it, but, like, we just have treatments for this thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like, why would you ever do that versus a 10-day or 12-day course of doxycycline? Well, I think it underscores that a lot of these chronic conditions are underfunded and under-researched. Oh, sure. And there are a lot of people who feel that there is nothing in medicine that uh, uh, is acceptable for them. And so you are driven to the mania of going, sure, I'll try bee stings down my spine. But what do you mean nothing's for them? What does that mean? Uh, meaning they've tried things and nothing is working. Oh, and there is a world where we genuinely tried everything and nothing's working. Yeah. So like with my AS, I am on my fourth or fifth medicine. And it's this maddening process where I don't have like a, a number that I get to print out and say, oh, it's 98% effective. Sure. I, we can look at the progression of the disease and go, okay, well, it's not progressing anymore. We can look at my inflammation markers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really like, how do I feel on a day to day? Mm -hmm. And I still have pain. Yeah. And I have to kind of remember, how much pain did I feel last year? It's very subjective. I think this is less. And they always try and say on a scale of 1 to 10 how much pain you have. I'm telling you, if you're in pain, you're always going to say 8. Yeah. Maybe you'll say 7 because you want to leave a little bit of room. But then I'll like cut your arm open. You go, okay, no, that's 10. Yeah. I, and then you, but then you, you stab your toe. That's 10. Like 10 is, uh, yeah, 10 is also subjective. And it's also subjective per person. Per person. Yeah. So the whole number scale... And your mental health impacts how you feel pain. Yep, yep. And experience pain. I, I hate the, the number scale. I understand its necessity, but I, I hate it. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, my point is for me, in that process where my medicines weren't working, absolutely I would have let a bee sting me because I'm just looking for anything. And if something has worked... And that's a shame. It's a shame that there that this stuff isn't better funded. Um, and That's they, the thing. Like, it is funded. Mm. There's a lot of natural remedies that are actively being tested, and our government actually does a lot of funding for it. And it just... you It's not sexy to hear about a study that proved something didn't work, so it doesn't make it down the path. I apologize. I meant that um, uh, the medicines are, oh, are underfunded. Yeah. Like... AS is a pretty well-researched disease, mm -hmm. but they're still working on it. Mm -hmm. And compared to, you know, it's just not well, a lot of funny around. Well, I will say AS and the medicines you're taking, you know, these are the number one profit driving drugs in the nation. I didn't know that. Yeah. So all the immunomodulators, those are the most expensive drugs in mm -hmm. terms of profit generating. Because what they do is... They don't allow them to go off patent like they do in Europe to make generics. It's really hard to make them. Right. They change their formulas around to keep them on patent a little bit longer. These are targeted at people who 
will take them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So you don't have a choice but to take them, but you also don't have a lethal condition, so you will live a full life. Mm. So you're going to need these for 150 years that you're going to live. Exercise is like the only thing that helps. Really? Diet and exercise. And of course, I'm on, I, I say that, which is a huge disservice to modern medicine. No, my <laughs> medicine is hugely important mm -hmm. and helps a ton. Um, but no, I, I did a year journey where my goal was to gain 20 pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. Call it 20 pounds of muscle. It was about okay. maybe five pounds of muscle and 15 pounds of <laughs> softness. Okay. Uh, but I changed my diet. I, I went mostly plant-based. I, I cut out all these inflammatory foods. I was working out three times a week, which for someone as lazy as me, huge life change. Amazing. Okay. Uh, Were you and, happy with what was going on? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I felt amazing. And I hit my goal and I dropped off a cliff. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm now trying to get back into the swing of things okay. and it's it's but when you were moving. doing like i'm curious why the drop-off happened did you not enjoy the exercise and all that or you were just like i need to hit the goal and that was the goal and then you hit it and then it kind of got boring yeah I, I mean it's just habits are really hard i'm i'm not an athletic person so okay. i never enjoyed exercise it okay. just has never hit for me but i i did a lot of habit stacking which is okay. something i picked up from all those like productivity podcasts okay. uh, tell me about those because i don't know what that okay, is. okay so habit stacking is the idea of combining something you don't like with something you love mm. so uh, an easy example is um every time i work out i'm gonna have a hershey kiss right it's like oh i this little thing i love but i i decided to give myself something more high value so weirdly i binged the, sh the show Succession okay. with working out, Ooh. which is a weird show to work out to, but it yeah. freaking worked for me. I don't know. Kendall what, you Roy. You were like, walking? Or no, running? no, I, I don't run. I, uh -uh. So what, what was the exercise that you were like, doing? I, it's all low impact, like weight. So like, like, so you like, do weights while watching Succession? Yeah. That's tough. Because that's yeah. not an audio only show. No, and so I would have to rewind. It's not the best show for this. <laughs> okay. um, I, I've told Colin and Samir, I listen to their podcast while working out. Okay. That's yeah. one that I like. Podcasts are a lot easier. Yeah, a lot easier. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you, you do, do your, like, push your push ups. ups and... And you consume it on a phone? No, no, I, on, my TV. on my TV. So I'm working out in my living room and like I bring all of my exercise gear. <laughs> I roll it out and my wife is like, what the hell are you doing? And then at the end, I roll it up, which also made me then hate it because that's another thing with habits yeah. is the lower resistance, the easier it is. So like if you want to work out, don't make it that you have to go to a gym. Don't even make it that you have to take your stuff out. Make it like as easy for you as possible. I'm anti a lot of these hacks. Well, hey, if it works and, and, for you, then I'm this thrilled. Is, this is why I'm curious your take on my opinion on it. Mm -hmm. My thought is when you start doing it in this way, unless you really enjoy the hacking process, because some people are like, like, you know, fidgeting with technology or whatever, trying different things out. By trying to do this and like hack it so much, it becomes so tedious and stressful and anxiety <laughs> inducing yeah. That actually, it takes away from the power of the hack. Okay, but you, I'm going to guess you didn't need the hack. What do you mean? I, I need the hack. You, you did the creator class. Yeah. You got yourself in in your, in your shape. Yeah. Were you, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some wild guesses. Okay. Student athlete? Yes. Runner? No. No. Not cross country? No. Hmm. Okay, I'm out of guesses. Sprinter, I mean. I oh, come on. But I didn't Sprinting do it. Sprinting is running. No, no, no. Like our track team in high school was like, it, you're on the soccer team. We need kids on the track team. Come run. On Were you event. on the soccer team? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is, this is a whole foreign world to me. No. But, I'm a, I'm a, feel my hands. They haven't worked a day in their lives. I am a soft boy. All right. Can we get you to like boulder? Have you heard of bouldering? I used to do bouldering. See? And I loved it. See, I think that's the sport for It's you. like puzzle. Yeah. But here's the I, so I never know what's right or wrong with, with my AS. So okay. ankylosing spondylitis, it's a... Uh, uh, I'm not telling you. I'm telling them. Of it's <laughs> Tell me. Uh, You're the expert on your own. No, illness. I'm certainly not. Well, about your symptoms at the very least. Yeah. So it's an inflammatory disease and, and I need to do things that are low impact. It, basically, the easiest way to understand it is it's spinal arthritis. It's in the spondyloarthritic family. Um, so I need to do things that are low impact. And when you boulder, which is rock climbing without ropes, when you're done, you just fall. Yeah. <laughs> you just jump off. And I'm True. like, that's probably not the best thing for me to like thud over and over. Okay. But maybe you're right. But but then I was thinking about it. Okay. Because I played pickleball for the first time the other day. That's pretty high impact. And it's high impact. Yeah. But I loved it. Yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, well, what? How did you feel when you were doing it after the fact? 
Oh, it hurt. It hurt. <laughs> but it felt, but it was yeah. good. And that's the thing is that I'm like, if I love it, I think physical activity is better than no physical yes, activity. Sure. So I think even if it's a high impact activity, there are ways for me to work it into. I don't think I need to be so binary about it, I guess okay. is what I'm saying. I think I would be better served if I, uh, you know, knew like, okay, play your pickleball weekly and then lay on your heat mat and sure. ice it and take some CBD and, and you're getting some physical activity. Mm-hmm. What about swimming? I, I, I don't have a pool. Mm. I'm just a gym near you that has a pool. Swimming would be the, go, yeah. the best thing for me, but that is, I've never, if I have to go to a gym, I won't work out. Sure. Weirdly I, too. I know that's tough because I know swimming is like not. When do you work out? Whenever I have time, to be <laughs> honest, these days. <laughs> I like working out at night. I'm like that's a okay. 9 p.m. exercise. If you're not doing high intensity, crazy stuff, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, people think I'm crazy when I tell them that, but no. it's like my body's so achy in the morning. Yeah. Like I it need, takes a while for you to warm up and get going. I got to get that rust off. Yeah. That's normal. I don't know. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. Wait, I, like normal. a lot of people will ask in some of the responding to comments questions, like when is the optimal time to work out? There's no answer for that. When you can do it. When you can do it, when you like to do it, yep. what works for you. Like it's so individualized. There's no one size fits all answer here. While Zach's healthcare struggles have been a burden, he has been supported by his friends and collaborators at the Try Guys, who despite their enormous success, hit a rough patch this year due to the controversial separation from fellow Try Guy, Ned Fall. We touch on this briefly, but for more info, you can learn more by reading any Reddit thread or watching them get parodied on Saturday Night Live. Zach didn't start getting portrayed by Mikey Day on SNL though. In fact, him and I got the same start to our internet careers here. We started in the same place. I got my start at BuzzFeed as well. What are you talking about? My viral success happened because a BuzzFeed article got me popular. No kidding. When you were working there, I presume. That's like 2015, cool. 2015, you were there? Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Wow. So like they wrote an article, check out this doctor. And I was like, whoa. Whoa. And then went viral. What were you posting on? Was it Instagram? Yeah. Instagram. Yep. And then since then, you guys left BuzzFeed. Uh-huh. Is BuzzFeed a thing? Didn't they go bankrupt or something? They have not. No, you're thinking of Vice. No, something happened with BuzzFeed News. Was they did BuzzFeed? shutter their news okay, division. That's what it was. Yeah, okay. which is a major bummer. Sad. Yeah, super sad. What was your like reason for leaving? Oh, it, I mean, there were a lot of reasons and also a very simple like entrepreneurial. reason. Entrepreneurial. Yeah, I, I, I was at BuzzFeed for four years and changed, maybe five. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I had reached the limit of what I could do there. Uh, that to grow, I needed to yeah. move on. Um, specifically with the, the Try Guys, it felt like we were, not by their fault, but we were in a box that was too small for us. Fair. And in order to explore it in all the ways that I thought we could, that necessitated moving on and, and taking control. Fair. There would have, there could have been a world in which they, you know, carved us out our own little mini studio. They weren't equipped to do that. So all of our contracts were coming up and we kind of just had this moment of, thinking about what could this look like as a company? Could we afford it? Would we make enough money to uh, support a a staff around us to be able to make videos of the same quality and Mm -hmm. then some? Um, And the answer was a resounding yes to all of those. And how did they react? They, I mean, we negotiated with them for a while to retain the rights. I mean, we we bought the Try Guys IP, which was certainly not a given. How much you pay? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not allowed to talk about it. How many figures? I could uh I'm not allowed to talk about oh, it. Okay. Not, not allowed to. I'll Link, tell you off camera. How many fingers? <laughs> no, it's uh I mean look, um it It was is, a lot of money. Yeah, of course. And and it was really cool that that they even allowed that to to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Um cuz there's you know, you make you create IP at a company, there is no obligation for them to give it to you. Sure. That is their show that I made. As an employee, yeah. that is, they, they own that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were, we were talking about yeah, starting over and trying to come up with new names and they all sucked. And what it, were some of the names for it, consideration? I literally like, I don't even like, it was like the guys and we're like, that's not even a thing. That's just that you can't just take <laughs> try out. Try guys were the guys. We, yeah. We like took our initials and tried some bogus thing. Like <sighs> nothing was even Nothing was even acceptable. Okay. It was all bad. Mm-hmm. And, but we were ready. We actually, we filmed two versions of our trailer launch video wow. 
one with I think we just said the guys and one with the try guys um, and like we were ready to, to hit publish because the, the deal was like hey this is just never going to happen and, then, and happened. then our lawyers were like wait Whoa. yeah and a week later how many on. videos have you made since then on your own oh who knows I mean because we were you know at BuzzFeed we would do 10 episode seasons or maybe we had 60 episodes when we were there and now we release two videos a week sometimes more Plus the podcast, and that's been every week for you know. Actually, now we've hit more time uh, solo, independent than at Buzzfeed. Oh we've, wow! Yeah, we've been over five years doing the channel. So potentially five hundred videos to like five hundred to eight hundred videos. I could figure it out, but I'm not going to lean over videos. for my phone. It's a lot. It's too many. I is think. there one that stands out in your head? And you're like, that's the video. Yeah. What I, video I, are you most proud of? Most proud of? I mean, okay. Yeah. My grandma's coming into town mm. from Russia. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, man, show her what you do. Show okay, me gram- the video. Videos for grandma, very different than videos for other people. Okay, my grandma's a hip 28 year your, your grandma's <laughs> cool as hell. <laughs> well, we have so many different things. And what mm. I love about the Try Guys is that mm. it's been such a giving format. True. We have our main show, The Try Guys, mm-hmm. uh, where we try different things. But then we have... Without a Recipe, which is a food cooking real- competition show that kind of is its own format unto itself. We have Eat the Menu we talked about. Mm-hmm. I make absurdist uh, chaos videos. There's no other be- better way to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one coming out. It'll be out by the time people are listening to this where I went to Cheesecake Factory wearing body paint. So it was like wow. no shirt, no shoes, no service. What if they don't know that I'm not wearing clothes? Oh. Uh, and it's really stupid and intentionally as obs- absurd and uh, stupid as possible. And I, I'm very proud of the dumb ones. Okay. Like, uh, you know, some people will do pranks. We like to do pranks on ourselves, the mm-hmm. people who are doing the prank. So we, we tried to trick Eugene into sitting on Keith's lap by uh, hiding Keith inside a chair. <laughs> it's really dumb, uh, but it makes me really happy. I, I, the absurdity is something that I, I really get off on. Wow. But Without a Recipe, I think, is the one that I would recommend to your grandma. It's, it is a show and the most indicative of what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you talk about, like, that's a lot of videos. Yeah. I love my job, and I love the opportunity that I have, and the opportunity that you're afforded as a digital creator to to green light any idea you have and, and run your own ship. But there is something really relentless about it. You, mm-hmm. It's an algorithmic platform You that requires a certain cadence of uploading. And for us to afford the team of our size that allows us to make premium content like Without a Recipe, we got to do the churn and burn. Yeah. We release stuff that I am not proud of. And I don't want to badmouth those videos because I don't think they're bad. Um, they're just not as artistically satisfying sure. And it creates a lack of consistency within the channel. So, you know, we had our, we had a, 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 a we'll call it a corporate shakeup uh, last year, mm-hmm. and so we've been doing. <laughs> what a kind way to put it. Corporate <laughs> shakeup. Corporate shake up. So a management restructure. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so we've been. I've been doing a lot of really deep thinking while steadying the ship and and making sure that everything's okay. I, I, I feel we were talking about this because I'll talk about how like we're changing everything and people are like it's been the same for eight months. I'm like, you don't know how slow things move sure. here. We we shoot two months in advance and then I stabbed myself and went on a wedding and Keith yep. was out of town. We got things going on. We're working. Um, but I, I want to really shift us uh, to a place where we're, we're prioritizing premium content mm-hmm. on digital. I don't know if that can be done. I don't know if that's what YouTube wants, but I'm going to try really dang hard. Why do you think that's not what YouTube wants? Uh, I don't mean YouTube the company, but I, I mean... The audience. Yeah, the audience. I, I just think that it is... When I think... I think that YouTube is ultimately about this connection. Mm-hmm. The connection between the audience and the creator. Mm-hmm. And frankly, I think the more you dress that up, the more there are these layers of uh, a barrier, these layers of separation. It creates an artifice. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess I'm, uh, it's not necessarily true because Mr. Beast, what he is doing is on the hugest production scale and is obviously paying insane dividends in terms of views. But at the end of the day, I think that there's something, um, even in his videos, there's something very, what's the word? Distant, not as transparent. 
I was going to say the opposite, actually. Um, you think it is very transparent? I, I think that a lot of the appeal of his videos in is in this idea of like hanging out and the camera just feels like it's hanging out there, mm -hmm. right? Like th there isn't... Uh, uh, yeah, like it's not a corporate network feel yeah. like on a typical game show that you would see on NBC or CBS. Exactly. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. And I think in part of that is developing a strong community with somewhat of a parasocial relationship. And to me, my biggest concern with doing that, obviously I'm in the medical space, it's a little bit different. But for you guys, like when you were going through your management restructuring, quote mm. unquote, wasn't it difficult to have a parasocial relationship with your audience in that moment? A hundred percent. I... I you know, look, the parasocial uh, relationship is the only reason I'm here. Mm -hmm. It's it's the the people who watch me. I I, I owe them everything, mm -hmm. and I I want to give them everything. But there has to be boundaries you create. Mm -hmm. It's it's a really tricky thing. I also don't want to abuse that relationship. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy to look at your audience and go like, we're friends and come on, you love me, support me. Yeah. We're not friends. Yeah. You don't know me. I'm lying to you all the time. <laughs> I'm curating what I give you. I'm trying to make myself look as good as possible. The job of a creator is to be as broadly likable as possible. Well, you're trying to entertain people. You're, you entertain. Don't make it seem like you're doing something evil here. I'm not trying to. Yeah. But hey, man, I could be. No. No, if you're doing it for nefarious purposes, if you're trying to take advantage of You don't know of people, my long game, Mike. What is your long game? No, I'm kidding. What did you plan in Scar's Day <laughs> in 1990? Yeah, no, it, it's just, I. it's something that I'm really acutely aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a drug, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. this temptation where you go, okay, well, if people like, uh, they want to get to know me, they want my personal life, now... Okay, cool. I guess I'll uh, show more and more show and more, show yeah. my relationship and my family and and that's how you get family vloggers mm -hmm. and like it just it it spirals out of control. I mean, mm -hmm. I I shared my wedding, but I had to do so by creating uh, really specific boundaries for myself mm -hmm. so that I was giving you know one turning it into art that I was proud of, mm -hmm. uh, giving the audience something that they liked, but making sure that I wasn't losing myself in that process. Give me an example of a boundary that you set for your wedding. Oh, I, there were so many. I Number one, I was not performing. Meaning what? When a camera turns on, I change. Okay. The, the intonation in my voice, the way that I spike a camera to make a joke. I am a different person when a camera is present. Okay. Um, so, you know, early on, my videographers, and I had told them that I didn't, and they were incredible. I don't want to badmouth them in <laughs> sure. any way. They rocked i loved my videographers um but i told them early on like i am not performing if you want someone to perform keith's right there eugene's right there mm -hmm. and uh, day one like it was actually even before the welcome party because we had like a multi-day event people got into town early they like came to me and they like tried to interview me on camera and i just was like i'm not giving you anything yeah i'm not gonna make any jokes i'm just living my life you capture me so maybe you just need to be yourself more often yeah I'm asking. I don't know. It's about being present in life, um, but also creating work. I, I've tried really, really hard to have work-life balance. Um, we, you know, are content creators. Sure. Everything is content. Everything you do. But I've made a point to not, you know, Instagram or Snapchat my dinners every day. Yeah. Like, I'm working. I have it's my work It's just so hours. tempting because it's like monetization. It's sure. Every, like, Harry Jowsey was just sitting here. He's like, Mike, you're not uploading on Snapchat, you're losing on revenue. I, and Sam's I, like, Mike, yeah, you're losing on revenue. And I'm like... Oh, I literally I, was texting about uh, with, yeah. with Lauren, Lord DIY, about yeah. this today. Um, and it's tempting, but at the same time, it's like, can I just eat my dinner without showing it to people? Yeah. Look, it's... I mean, one, I don't think that's a place where I thrive. It's, that's true. It you, depends on the person. It's know thyself. And I think for Harry... I have that tattooed on my back. No kidding. In Latin. What but, is it What is it in Latin? No se te ipsum. <laughs> Say it again. No se te ipsum. Say it slower. No se te ipsum. I like it. I'm definitely saying it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the slower that you made, the, yeah, I made you say it, the inaccurate. more revealing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but uh, for someone like Harry, I imagine that is the cornerstone of his business, yes. and there are things that I do that he can't do. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, that was a, a decision that I made, or I, I'm trying to make again and again is that I don't want to be an influencer in that sense. That's that's not why I got into this. And sure. even though there are the temptations, I don't want to lose myself in the content. I want to express myself in the content. That's a very mature thought. I'm trying. 
Because it's very easy to lose yourself. Yeah. When there's money involved and outside influence and success and numbers and cloud and all this stuff. Yeah. It's tempting. And everything that we do has a metric associated with it. Yes. And everything. And everything we do. Watch time, retention, mm-hmm. rankings, views. I don't know if normal people... Norm, Even know normal they, people. Yeah. Uh, people. If, if people. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if people realize that uh, in the YouTube back end, they rank your video blank out of 10. Mm-hmm. So every day when your video comes out, like how it's performing in the first three hours, it's number four out of 10 compared to your last releases. Yeah. Uh, and when you get a 10 out of 10, nine out of 10, you feel bad. That was my yesterday. Yeah, it sucks. It was sad. And you know what really sucks too, is that yesterday's video, I don't know what it was, but it, if it was one that you were really passionate about, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter, yeah. but it does. And you try, but you know, you, and you try I, to not let it. I've gotten a little bit better because I've been in moments enough times over the last five years where the numbers dropped. And then I was like, no, you got to stay the course, keep doing what made you successful, keep being passionate about what you do, and the numbers will come. Mm. And following that mantra allows me to keep calm about the nine out of tens and 10 out of tens. I'm glad to hear that. But it's, man, that's hard. That takes some discipline. Do you think there are uh, uh, things from your medical practice or maybe even just your medical mind that have lent itself to YouTubing? Very different field. Yeah. um, The idea of what drives a click is largely based on psychology. Yeah. So what my patients are curious about, how they think about medical problems or what's going on in the news leads me to create better, at least ideas of content and then thumbnails of content because it's all a psychological mind game. That makes sense. But it, it, Spider-Man-esque, with great power comes great responsibility. You don't want to take advantage of that trust. Yeah. Because it's very easy to turn into a Dr. Oz where you're like, here's how your horoscope affects your heart health. I want to know. See, you're clicking <laughs> oh, on that freaking video. I want to know. Sam will sometimes pitch me like such a great concept. Yeah. He's like, here's the one way to cure acne for good. I'm like, I'm clicking on that video because I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. like medically, you got to be honest. You got to be. And honestly, that just doesn't apply to medicine. I feel like that's pretty broad. But And I think, though, that that is something that uh, your your audience will appreciate. And over that's, time. Over time. Yeah. I, I think that there is, you know, I, I'm at a point now where I've been doing YouTube for nearly a decade. Yeah. And I, I get really excited talking to, you know, I go to VidCon and, like, I mm-hmm. talk to the new creators. And, like, I think it's really important to to keep learning about things that people are discovering. Yeah. But I'm also super fascinated talking to people that have, that have been here for a long time and how do you sustain this as a career? Yes. And it's it's not something that really anyone, many not many people have answered. Well, because there's anyone. no one else, no one's really done that. No, there's you, like a handful of names like yourself that have been doing it for yeah. that long. Otherwise, it's like, who do you go to? It's like a very small niche community. Yeah, it's, I mean, I could probably count it on one hand if not two. And if you tell normal people, normal people again, yeah. your problems... Oh, you didn't make your million views. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If I got a thousand views, I'd be happier. You ungrateful little. Shit. And it's like, I know, but I have to pay Sam and Dan's health insurance, yep. and they have a lot of medical problems. <laughs> I can relate. No, yeah, it, it's look. Unfortunately, I, I want to just be a weird artist. That's I would be thrilled. I don't yeah. care about money at all. But art and economics have always been connected. You, sure. you can't create in a vacuum and. So long as we live under capitalism, this is how we do it. And that's also, you asked what else helps me with my medical career into the YouTube career, is the same way that you just said it's art economics. Mm. Medicine is art and science. So like the approach to getting the glass out of your leg, the decision of how to approach that, was as much art as it was a science. Tell me more. Well, you can go to two different doctors and they'll be scientifically accurate with two different opinions. And the way that they either explain both options to you or apply those options to you will change based on their art of medicine. Interesting. And that art is where our system collapses because we've lost that art when we turn it into an assembly line, where we turn it into all capitalism, click boxes, check boxes, 
EHRs, and we forget that there's a human sitting in front of us who has a wedding that they were on a treadmill for, and now they have glass in their leg, and they're worried if they're ever going to walk again. Until you said the wedding, I was like, are you talking about YouTube or medicine? Because <laughs> <laughs> both of them felt accurate. Right? That's why yeah. they're both interchangeable. I want to do a surgery video, a, a Try Guys Try Surgery video, and I'm wondering if there's like a surgery dummy or something. There is. Yeah. And it's like $30,000. So, okay, I've looked this up and I've seen really how expensive, expensive it is. It was on Shark Tank. How do I get it? We need to start a GoFundMe. <laughs> I, I, I don't got that Mr. Beast money. Yeah. I got it. Maybe Just, Mr. Beast can fund it for us <laughs> and we'll sponsor it by Feastables or something. <laughs> I gave I gave a poor YouTuber <laughs> his surgery dummy. Yeah, exactly. I, there's but then be. we can donate it to a school after we're done with it. I'm cool with that. Yeah. If a, if the company that makes the surgery thing is listening, Mike and I would like to poke around yes. in its plastic body. Sam, send him this clip. Send, yeah, he's we on have it. it. We have it on our Shark Tank video. I remember I reacted to it. Heck yeah! But it's really realistic. And does it bleed? Does it squirt at you? No, 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 it doesn't bleed. That'd but like fun. the structures are real. I want to do surgery without learning how to do surgery. Okay, and I want to what just, surgery? Like if you could pick any surgery. Oh, that's I don't know. Uh, an appendixitis. An appendectomy. Appendectomy. Um, I think you would have more fun doing something. Uh, maybe you could have that. Yeah, this is this is how the video like a C section. Is I come up sure. Yeah. Because then it's like two lives in one. Whoa, that's high risk. Yeah. <laughs> now I wonder are, if I could just let you guys operate on me. Can we do that? Like legally? Like, yeah. Can I r give you the like? What can you take out of my body? <laughs> I'm trying to think. Now, see, you're really thinking like a YouTuber. I now. would need like, to get like an abscess. Oh, if Mr. Beast can be in a pool for two days or say a hundred thousand times Logan Paul or whatever he's done, I can let you guys operate on my body. Do you have a lipoma? No. I just want to say for the record, his idea, and I love this. <laughs> I'm in, I mean, I, yeah, let I me mean, inside it's for your body. Education. I always said I would donate my body to science. You just maybe I'm just doing it earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Zach had the the hair transplant surgery. Yes. And Mike has talked about doing it on his beard. Oh yeah. Oh. I had like a patch that I wanted to show people what it's like. Yeah. So like I I, I got the guys. I'll hook you up. But can you do it? Yeah. They use usually they use a robot. Oh. But that's not entirely. So they use the robot for the extraction. Mm. And what it's so crazy gross. Mm -hmm. They. Basically, just like take like yeah, like poke little holes, holes. in. I mean, in my case, in and my then they head, plant them. and then they they extract with the machine one follicle at a time, and then they it, you see it's like this little follicle yeah. with like a, a little Baby flesh egg nub. Thing, yeah. yeah, it looks like a little like a little like a sushi egg almost, mm -hmm. and then they they one by one implant. So can you it. do that? I don't. I yeah, I'll call them. Yeah, just be like, hey, can I do this? Can I do it? I don't know. Or I call my dental friend. I would... Daniel, he'll you, let you take out my teeth. I've wanted to do a dentist video too. Yeah. Oh my God. We have a lot of medical stuff. Place we of an ear? Yeah. I can't believe... That's probably painful though. I bet it is. Yeah. I'm looking at your face. Mm -hmm. It's a great face. Big fan yeah. of that face. <laughs> and the idea of like... <laughs> slicing. I, slicing it. That like is... I, I, doing surgery on you... Uh, hugely intimidating. That's fun, doing though. surgery on your face is I, I feel like is is a lot of pressure, okay. but also I don't know that I could steady hand it. It's not the hands that. What I'm about the electrocautery about. tool? I, it's not the hands that I'm worried about. It's it's the ment. I think you. I think doctors yeah. underappreciate or underestimate the mental hurdle that us normies have to get over to. To cut flesh. Cut flesh. Yeah. Especially a face, a face yeah. flesh. A face is hard. Maybe you guys, we'll I mean, you're pimple. so steeped in the Dr. Mike world. You you could cut flesh? No. <laughs> he could get, couldn't he give you stitches? You could have a, a dermatologist. You could have Dobble cut your arm. Stitches. And have him do stitches. That's kind of boring. You know what I'm thinking about, too, that I'm realizing? So, surgeries, uh, invasive surgery is demonetized on YouTube. Is it? And I know Why do you know this? Because we did an earwax extraction video, which is not an invasive surgery. It's kind of ASMR, Jason. People like the sat like yeah. like um uh, pimple popping. It's yeah, like yeah. very satisfying. And they demonetize it and they called it invasive because we were entering the body. That's which weird. I think is bullshit. Well how did you take out the earwax? 
uh, with like a Scoopy. And it was medical And a camera. Uh, was it a doctor? It was like an earwax guy. What the hell is an earwax guy? <laughs> it was guy? a guy. I think it was an ENJ. Uh, oh, an ENT. ENT. Okay, so it was a doctor. Yeah, it was a okay. doctor. Well, as long as you were doing under medical care, I don't know why they said that, that was problematic. I, I agree. One of the Try Guys' most popular series is called Eat the Menu, where Zach's friend Keith goes to a chain restaurant and eats literally everything on the menu. I would know because I actually helped him eat Del Taco menu earlier this year. How Keith manages to endure consuming every item from a fast food menu in just one sitting is a medical miracle that leaves even me stunned. We've talked about Keith as a competitive eater, and I actually think what he does is possibly more impressive or as impressive on a different scale yeah. than competitive eaters. It's, it's uh, the difference between sprinting and a marathon. Mm -hmm. He's a marathon eater. He is a marathon eater. And he's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. I want to like break down his body scientifically. Like what Ooh. is happening to when him? he eats? Like what is his, what are his vital signs before and after and eat Ooh. the menu? I can, I can make a prediction. Yeah. So like when you eat something like Del Taco that is incredibly high in sodium, I guarantee his blood pressure goes up and his weight would probably go up from water weight, not just a food weight. Whoa. Cause the sodium is going to make him hold on to some more water. It like he gets food drunk and he looked this up and it's something where his brain is literally trying to shut him down from eating because it's like you won't stop eating. Mm -hmm. We just need to flood him so he gets sleepy. Yeah. And that's that's a food drunk's a real well, thing. Well, that's why when people say like, oh, Thanksgiving tryptophan, turkey, all this stuff, like it's not really the tryptophan. It's you're eating a carb load giant <laughs> meal and you're going to get sleepy when you eat a giant meal. So explain this to me. Is it is what he's saying correct that your brain is sending like chemicals? Evolutionary to try? speaking, I have no idea, but okay. it is part of it. Like that, you do get sleepy. That's a normal human response because huh. you're eating a lot of calories. Also, I'm sure it has something to do with circulation. When you're consuming that much food, you have to dedicate a lot of blood flow to your stomach, to your intestines. Yeah. And when you're taking resources from one part of the body to another, you're going to get tired. I, so we uh, we tried I we filmed the video the other day where we were attempting to eat four hundred something dumplings right we went to wow, a bunch of different nice. restaurants in the San Gabriel Valley <laughs> incredibly delicious by the end of it the idea of flavor nauseated me like <laughs> that's normal like I wanted to eat styrofoam I couldn't even I, like something came to me and it was a delicious bite and the, that made me like no nauseous yeah but my body. There was no room left. And it got to a point where it was just like, if you're going to keep doing this, something's got to give. Something's going to come out like the other way. gas was trying, like, I, I, I don't know how graphic I want to get here, but no. it just was like, I'm going to fart not because I want to, but because there's literally no, no other choice. Yep. I, think, you know. I think that's the perfect way to wind down this podcast. <laughs> Thank you for that, Zach. Uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. No, seriously, me. thank you for coming by. Where do you want to send everybody to watch? Well, this is a podcast, so I think you should come over and listen to my podcast. I have two okay. of them. Uh, I have Guilty Pleasures, which is all about the movies that, you, that you're that you afraid to admit you love. Uh, okay. it's, it's the under-celebrated. I, I have one. What's yours? It's going to be something terrible like Uptown Girls or something. Yes. This is perfect. I love the chick flick era. Come on the show, Mike. Okay. Yes. Can you give me like a movie, a trivia question right now to end up the end A up trivia up? question? Yeah. Okay, like, give me a, a line, and I'll tell you what movie it's from. Okay, I'll end with that before I'll plug my other show, The okay. Tripod. We've lately, we've, uh, we've been doing plogging, which is us podcast vlogging. Mm. So we've been trying to go to the stupidest places in the world possible. Uh, a lot of Starbucks drive throughs but we <laughs> went to a Chuck E. Cheese. Nice. Uh, we're going to start coming to people's houses. Nice. I think we're going to be in the Smosh office in a couple of weeks. We're, we're just going to show up and see if they'll well, let if us record a podcast. York, you know where I'm going to come. Do it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, plugging at the hospital. Yeah. Um, uh, so go check out the tripod. Okay, a movie quote to end on. Okay, I'm going to give you a quote from my favorite movie ever made. And I'm going to see if you can get it. Meet me in Montauk. Oh my God. What is Montauk? And you got to whisper it. Meet me in Montauk. It's not the notebook. Mm-mm. <laughs> It's not sleepless think, in Seattle. No, think um, think less rom com and more movie about love that is uh, forbidden. No, no, it's I, I guess you would call it sci fi, not really sci fi, but 
Alien? I don't know. What? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Oh, I didn't watch it. Dang. You want to come over? Yeah. All I right, want to watch cool. it. Actually, that's Jim Carrey, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to watch that. There's that and I want to watch Lost in Translation. I don't know why I put both of those movies in the same category. They uh, they came out around the same time. And, and it was they like come a, up on the same Netflix like recommendation. It was a movement of, of like indie filmmaking having yeah. a lot of success. Yeah. So those two I got to watch. Movie movie date. I'm I'm in. I'm in. Uptown Girl, Eternal Sunshine, Devil Feature. Yes. Heck yeah. 13 going on 30. Let's go. Oh, you are you are perfect See, for this show. See, those are the kind of movies that I watch. All right, get over here. <laughs> we'll do it. Thanks, man. I'm hyped. Click here to see me react to the Try Guys enduring a labor pain simulator. It's one of their most popular videos ever and makes me cringe. As always, stay happy and healthy.